is telling on my um, wife was saw me give a paper to our neighbor in Boston. Somehow she came to my paper and she said, Porter, you better write out your comments. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're just going to ramble on. So I did that. I, I typed up uh, two and a half pages of um, comments and then this conference is, I mean the thing about conferences like this where you're all going to every session and thinking about every paper is that the things fall apart. Uh, the center will not hold. I mean, I, I, there is so much um, going on that I already, um, I, 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 I wish I'd take this over again. <clears throat> anyway, this is um, the, the essay that went online for this um, uh, conference. It's part of a, it's part of an enterprise I've been engaged in for about 15 years. Uh, in a variety of ways, two main strains. The first uh, is, how, and, and both of them have to do with how narrative fails. Um, uh, there have been so many people who have talked about how narrative is a fundamental aspect of our nature, uh, and it's probably genetic. Uh, and uh, you know, Antonio Damasio read him. Uh, there's, he talks about a pre-linguistic narrative operation in what he calls the proto-self before the core self. There's the proto-self. I'm not mocking him. I, mean, I, love, I, I love what he writes, but I don't know whether it's true or not. But, and so our first encounters with the world are these tiny little flippers of narrative that don't have any language with them, but they're, they're, they're grasping things and, and making our, our knowledge, whether that's true or not. I don't know, but so my interest has been in when um, occasions when narrative fails, and um, <clears throat> the more I look around, the more I see um, modes of failure that we seem to accommodate very well, and then modes of failure that distress us. Two main lines uh, of this inquiry: uh, the first uh, is not necessarily chronologically has been. Uh, how narrative copes what, with what cannot be known, with the unknowable. That, the fruits of that are going to come out in, in December in um, the Ohio State series on narrative. And it's titled Real Mysteries, uh, Narrative and the Unknowable. What this paper uh, comes out of is the other strain, which has to do with real things that we know about in the world, um, but which cannot be accommodated by narrative without serious reduction, distortion, or even uh, outright falsehood. <coughs> and, um, and, and, and two of these, uh, uh, two, uh, uh, the basis of this um, um, work of mine uh, began, that this work began with two companion essays. Uh, the first in, I think, 2002, um, on the inability of a narrative to, um, of, uh, to handle uh, evolution by natural selection. Uh, and that came out in a volume edited by David Herman, um, uh, which was actually published here in, in Stanford. Um, and the other was a companion piece that extended that to um, emergent behavior in general. Um, stock market, traffic accidents, uh, slime mold, uh, you name it. So this essay uh, that, I've, uh, that, that you have read for this uh, conference puts the impact of the unnarrable character of Darwin's evolutionary mechanism. And it's, and it's the mechanism, it's an evolution by natural selection specifically that I'm talking about, that is so difficult to accommodate um, <coughs> fully by, by narrative. It's trying to, this is uh, what I've done is I put it in an, an historical context. Much has been written about how scary Darwin's theory was and continues to be. It is, after all, a species, a theory of species change that is godless, amoral, chance infested, and non teleological. Uh, my focus 
here is on another scary aspect of the theory, a scariness of which has not received much, if any, attention. Uh, and this is its extreme gradualistic model of change. And uh, bear in mind that uh, Darwin's model of change was even more gradual than 20th century uh, evolutionary models of change. Um, he <coughs> had no place in his theory for mutations. He called them sports. And they were weird things that simply happened. So what he was dealing with was the tendency of, of, of the constant tendency of variation. Uh, how every, everyone in this room, for example, is a, 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 a tiny micro variety of homo sapiens, or homo sapiens sapiens, if you want to call it, call it that. And that's all I have to go by, just these tiny, tiny little, little changes. Now, there, there, that aspect of the theory has been dealt with, often with regard to deep time, uh, and the difficulty uh, that we, as, uh, we human beings have of imagining deep time. Our minds were designed to, to do that. There's no necessity for us to be able to think about deep time. Uh, we have been able to do it. Um, but, uh, I don't think, I, I, I know of no efforts to, to deal with what I have, uh, I have been dealing with. Um, Darwin didn't ex invent extreme gradualism. Uh, Lamarck's theory is almost as gradualistic, uh, and that was uh, to the year, 50 years before the publication of uh, The Origin of Species. And before Lamarck, there was James Hutton's theory of, of uh, geological change. And James Hutton, of course, was, was developed and popularized in Sir Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, the first volume of which uh, Darwin famously took with him on the voyage of the Beagle, and had an immense influence on his own thoughts about, <coughs> the, gradualist, uh, about the gradual nature of, of change. What made Darwin's gradualistic model disturbing um, was that it lacked agential entities. Um, as, uh, as creatures who tell narratives and have a thirst and craving for narratives, um, there are degrees of what narratologists call narrativity. Uh, which is a real word and actually a more interesting word than narrative because it gets you away from trying to define what is a narrative and I simply define it as uh, the representation of an event. And I've said, uh, but uh, narrativity is the degree to which you think you are in listening to a story. And, and there are many ingredients that can go into narrativity. Uh, Marie Laura Ryan, I think, listed 12 uh, in the in an essay, um, I think there are probably more than 12, but one of them is to have human beings, for example, and another is to have um, human being who acts at, act as agents, or if you're not human beings, gods acting as agents, either among themselves or a single god or, or, or what have you. It's a very important element. Um, there is no agential uh, entity in that sense in evolution by natural selection. In fact, there, you may argue that there are no entities <laughs> at all if we're talking about species because Darwin himself acknowledged that um, his theory really robbed species of meaning. What is a species but uh, a certain degree of variation? Um, so, what you have is this ooze of change. Um, every once in a while you do have an event, and that's uh, a meteor, uh, a volcano, uh, something else, and even in the aftermath of that, change is, is quite slow. But otherwise, you not only have a general entities, you not only have, seem almost to have no entities at all, and arguably you don't, you don't have any events, except for meters and so on. 
um, it's, it's, this is swarm of micro events uh, operating on a swarm of characteristics. Um, uh, too, too great to, to count. And therefore, it moved at such a granule, with such granular complexity, and such a glacial pace that it, that it, that, that it lacked even the event structure uh, that makes narrative possible. <coughs> one day, uh, when uh, Darwin's model, um, Dar Darwin's origin of species was published, um, it added an imp impetus to generalizing the, a gradualistic model of change to almost all areas of uh, human inquiry where change happens. And of course, one of those areas is human development and popular phrases, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. And uh, so um, <coughs> if you were an up-to-date um, Victorian, uh, and most of them were, uh, uh, you read Darwin. Uh, Thomas Harvey was very proud of having been one of the first readers of Darwin. Doubt whether he read a first edition that was gone in half a day or something like that. But <clears throat> um, my speculation is that the numerous life stories and fiction, both fictional and non-fictional, both in the novels of uh, George Eliot, uh, Thomas Hardy, Kissing, Zola, um, or, or autobiographies by uh, um, uh, uh, countless um, autobiographers that, that followed in Darwin's wake and that are quite rightly seen as influenced by Darwin in their linear, naturalistically detailed, anti-supernaturalist form were also reactions to Darwin in promoting the illusion that a human life, at least, had the narrative <coughs> structure of a succession of events in time. In other words, these were, in a sense, domestications of Darwin, that you could, you could set down uh, the, the major moments in, in a life. And um, uh, Leslie Stephen was the first editor of the, the um, the um, uh, inside the, uh, the dictionary of of of, of 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 national biography, and 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 he was a great promoter of that idea, as were many others. So it 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 carried over a lot from Darwin, but it was digesting Darwin and it was restoring the narr the narrative qualities that we crave. Um, and this, of course, happened also in the post-Darwinian. Um, adaptations of evolutionary theory to, to, to species itself. There were a number of, of those. It's Herbert Spencer uh, creating, um, well, actually, he's, he started his theory before Darwin, but, but his theory is essentially teleological, and, um, and you could chart it in, in, in a way that you could not chart Darwin's um, uh, evolution of species, because species was go were going nowhere. Mm -hmm. It just were just going nowhere. Um, <clears throat> anyway, these remarks are meant to frame three points that relate to, I think, to the other papers on my on the panel. And the first um, may not seem to relate, but I think it does, and that is the necessary pastness of narrative. That is, narrative recounts. It tells a story. And the illusion, at least, is that the story is somehow available and ready to be delivered in narrative form. Um, some narrative theorists, um, uh, he, however, argue that a story in itself does not exist until it is told. Hayden White, for example, argues that history does not exist until it is, to use his word, retrospectively plotted. Um, we make history not by doing great things, but by writing them up. All the same, he may be, and there are others who made the same kind of argument. I mean, I think he is right, but the feeling is that the story is already there to be told, 
and you had that very strong feeling. And this is why narratives frequently, most, most commonly, are written in the past tense. And when they're in the present, it's often called the historical present. But I think even can, this case can even be made for simultaneous narration. I think it can be made for staged. We, na we now talk about narratives on stage and narratives in film, even though uh, up until quite recently, there were still purists who said, no narrator, no narrative. You know, this is something else on the, on the stage. But we're very aware um, that it has already been made, packaged. It's an artifact. Uh, we're aware of that. But we're, uh, we're also aware, as we watch it, that this is something that happened and is going to be over. It has an end. The end is coming up. And all the rest of it. So first point. If one's life is conceived as a narrative as it unfolds, then one's life is an enactment of a story that pre-exists it. And this would be a special meaning of the biblical, it is written. And um, I, I learned on Google that there are 80, over 80 instances of it is written in the Bible, most of them exhortatory, it is written that you should do that, and so on. But there are some that are or it is written that this this will happen. Um, I I know very little about Islam, uh, though you often hear that in, in popular renditions. It is written that this will happen. I can tell you one of my sons lives in Indonesia, the world's largest uh, Muslim country, and he tells me that um, the people in Solo. Uh, Java, um, often when they drive at night, they drive with no headlights. Uh, and when you ask them about this, uh, that, they said, oh, I, I am in the hands of Allah. Uh, and, and correlatively, uh, these, um, the citizens of Seoul, often when they walk across the street, they don't look in either direction. They just plunge ahead. Rarely do they get hit. Um, in fact, he's never observed that, but he has observed this happen, and he's asked about it. He said, well, when the answer is, when my number's up, it's up. Now, that's a kind of lead enacting a life that has already, in some way, been written. I don't want to beat that point into the, into the ground. But then my second point is that for those who don't see their lives as written, and this is kind of implicit in almost everything that's been said here, there would seem to be two general ways of thinking about themselves as selves in time. And one would be the Augustinians, along the model of St. Augustine, who basically invented the modern, modern autobiography. Um, uh, that is as an act of what uh, Augustine called recollection. Uh, and he says it right there. I, thousands and thousands of things happened to me. I sweep them from my memory how the phrase goes, so that I can find those moments that led to what I am now, like reading the Neoplatonists, meeting a weird guy named Faustus, who was representative of the Manichaeans, and then eventually on up to the time when he heard the children outside the windows, and he heard a child saying, go and read, go and read, and he goes and reads that. And, and, and that's, that's it. So there is a structure there waiting to be found. Uh, among all the detritus of your of your life, and I think this would even even hold with the kinds of things that uh, Alexander ne Nehemus has been talking about. If you can if you can write your life in several ways, depending on the point at which you start, it's inevitably going to be. If you're going to write a story, if you're going to tell a narrative, it's going to be an act of elimination as much and or more than it is an act of of construction out of. Uh, out of what's what's left. The other kind then um, would be naturally um, the Strawsonians. I guess it's the way that if you want to take the last paragraphs of that uh, uh, landmark essay that that um, Strawson wrote. But that is, those who don't see any pressing need to do this, to call a story out of their lives, are just willing to go from one point to the next. And, and I must say, um, that's me. I, 
I, I would be, I, I've tried to think, how would I narrativize my life uh, uh, if I were inclined to do it? And I, I must say, I feel wanting and I feel judged. Uh, and, but, and, you know, it, I mean, I've run into others who are like this, and Strassen talks about others. Um, and so I wonder if it is intemperate uh, that uh, Suzanne talked about in her, in her. I mean, something you start with. Um, uh, uh, either that, I won't call it rage for order, but some, some kind of need for uh, encapsulating yourself in narrative and, and creating those, a powerful story, which, is, which is, is, is very important. I was, I'm very interested in the comments, um, commentary on Montaigne and, um, and the kind of unity that you can, um, you can call out of what is, you know, what, um, quite, self-consciously, self-reflectively, and, and the rest of it disunified. And yet we all agree on yeah, Montaigne, Montaigne and, 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 and there is some kind of unity there. It keeps producing in the same way. It is like art. And I, I would suspect that M Montaigne was other things, uh, different kinds of things, that there were all kinds of content that didn't make it into those essays. In other words, he's an artist. And he's obeying the rules of art, which depend on certain kinds of repetition, often highly subtle sorts of repetition, so you recognize that the work has that coherence. But it does bring us back to the whole question of coherence and the question of unity. And the question is, do you really want to be unified? Do you, uh, a, a coherence, of, you know, trying to be coherent here in my, in, my, in my talk and so on, but in my life, in my, uh, I guess I, 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 people need to depend on me to be coherent and, and, and in that way. But do I depend on myself to be coherent? I, I can't answer that question. Anyway, I've got to, I must raise something. I, I'm rambling and I, I've got a, a, a third point. My third point, and it bears directly on, on book papers, is that one important art form that is, I, I don't think it's mentioned in either paper, <coughs> is improv. Uh, I-M-P-R-O-V. <coughs> this is an art that does take shape in the present. I mean, that's, that's, that's what's so great about it. Um, if any of you have seen it, uh, well done. Arguably, it is an art we all practice, however unimpressively, many times a day, improvising on the spot, different performances in different venues for different audiences. True improv, labeled as such, is an art of entertainment. And I think this is the best sense in which Wilde can be seen, Oscar Wilde, as having been an artist of the self. He may at times recycle material, as Elijah notes, but there is no doubting the powers of his on-the-spot invention. I very much doubt that he performed in this way in every waking moment. Rather, I believe, and Elijah has a good phrasing here in reference to performance artists, though I would not apply that label to one. <clears throat> Briefer performances, more tolerant of improvisation. And so finally, however, and this is a, yet another point about Wilde, and his art, if you agree with me, that this is his primary art. However self-indulgent, narcissistic, and in love with novelty this art was in Wilde's practice of it, I do not see him as one of Owen Flanagan's strong poetic persons, at least as Owen describes them in that his was an art of verbal daring and risk-taking keyed to a real threat from a real enemy. Uh, and, and something I think very few of us Americans in the room have, 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 have felt. I mean, we do complain about the government and, 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 and the party in power and, and, and all the rest of that, but we have enormous freedom. Um, uh, he, and especially given his um, sexual inclinations, was in danger. 
Uh, there was this game of don't ask, don't tell. But here again, he was always coming right up close to Todd. He, he took that risk uh, on him on himself. So, and 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 he 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 he, he continually thrived on poking his enemy in the eye, declaring his credibility. So, if as narcissism, his art was unbecoming, to use, I think, Elijah's term, um, that was one of its aims, to be un unbecoming. Um, unbecoming. However much then, he may have come to see in his life a tragic shape in, in, in later years. Uh, I think the predominant artistic form that he continued to play in the present tense, as it were, uh, and arguably right up deep to the end was improv. And he played it with the same non-conforming spirit. After all, his deathbed quit. Uh, you know, it's either me or the wallpaper. One of us has got to go. Um, that skewered one of the hallowed scenes of Victorian tragedy. I mean, that was the scene of scenes where the soul departs and the, uh, the flame on the candle is a little nail that's gone. Um, and, 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 and he's doing something quite different there from tragedy. So that's the end of my comments. Thank you.